Well, There's the government, long before IBM started talking about making scanners or anybody else started talking about laser scanners, um, the government has, had developed, uh, the government uh, under, under a uh, um, the, the group called the Bureau of Radiological Health, which came under another organization headed by Casper Weinberger, mm. remember Casper Weinberger. Um, and that group developed standards for all laser products. Mm -hmm. And they stood, they don't call themselves the Bureau of Radiology. Part of NIST? Part of, part of NIST? The National Institute of Standards and Technology? No, this was uh, uh, the, uh, the BRH come under. Today they call themselves the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, CDRH. Oh. Um, and they often look to a group called ANSI, American National Standards, and they had their own laser safety standards. Okay. And um, they tried to work closely with them, but their standards were not the same. Um, and the, um, the BRH standards were developed before anybody thought about scanning. They just said, you got a one milliwatt laser, you're gonna get one milliwatt into your eye. Mm -hmm. Of course, when it's scanning and you take the duty cycle into account, um, then it's not, which is one million. Unless your eyes moving and, real fast. Yeah, that's right. Unless <laughs> your eyes moving real fast. Now they do have a peak power uh, um, uh, requirement or limitation in the standards also. So if I had a 50 milliwatt laser, they'd say, "Well, I don't care. Your peak power is so high, it's going to cause damage." But at one milliwatt, if you have a, a very large duty cycle, um, then the net result, all you're concerned about, is average power okay. into the eye. And um, we went to a uh, a lot of um, effort to uh, try to make sure that these things were safe. Um, I personally dealt with the, the fellow who was in charge of the um, laser eye research at Duke University. Um, I can't think of his name offhand, but um, he, uh, he and I had some disagreements uh, uh, about the safety in the eye. I, I was fortunate in 72, 73, living in Rochester because I you had the Mayo Clinic right there in Rochester. And I spent many hours, many days at the Mayo Clinic Library doing research on, on the human eye and mm. uh, uh, biological effects of optical laser beams and that sort of thing. And um, because of that, I went, when I dealt with the fellow from Duke, I was probably better prepared. Not, how to be self-serving, but I was probably better prepared on eye safety uh, from lasers than he was. He knew more about the effects of what he did when he punched holes in racist monkeys' eyes and <laughs> grabbed Yeah, what eyes. part of Duke was he from? Was he Pardon? from the medical school? What part of Duke was he from? Uh, it was Duke University. But the medical school or? Uh, I, I don't, I forget the exact title of what he was, but he was, okay. uh, was ophthalmology research and that sort of thing. So I guess it might be part of the medical school. Um, but he and I had a severe disagreement about what was happening in the eye, and he was wrong. Uh, and I knew that based on the research that I had done at the Mayo Clinic Library. And it's funny because it was coming to a head. He was, he was supposedly our outside expert that we had hired. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually they had a meeting down there with, with me and this, I won't mention, if, if I think of his name, I won't mention it because I want to embarrass him. Uh, with me and this professor, this Duke researcher, and several people from IBM, including Bo Evans, mm -hmm. and who was, I believe, a head of SDD at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, after hearing these debates, Bo's comment set aside to someone else I learned later on and said, you should take this professor and put Dixon and, and it, it, the two of them in a room and let them duke it out. <laughs> but eventually, to the guy's credit, at Duke, he said, yeah, Dixon's right. So, because that was holding up product announcement. Yeah. We could not get product announcement without the support of our own expert on the effects of the human eye. That's, That's right. That's right. Nobody, okay. there wasn't any bureau telling us we couldn't do this. Okay. This was strictly IBM saying, we're not going to go out unless our own expert agrees that this, this product is safe. Okay. And so that's eventually what it came down to. Uh, but, uh, and I, I got along real, real well with that guy. He's a Baltimore guy, just like I am. It, it, and so eventually it all turned out amicably, even though we had some rather strong disagreements at the time. But uh, after that, and after uh, the work that we did at the, uh, at the EIA, uh, the, the whole issue of laser safety 
went rather smoothly. Um, having to meet this re class one requirement was still a major issue and uh, it was more of an issue for our competitors than it was for us. What and does class were, one mean? What are the rules on class the, one? The class one is like 40 mic or 0.39 microwatts. Oh. <laughs> That's really low. Even yeah. with the duty cycle we have, we couldn't get down that low. We could get down to, uh, instead of 0.4, round it off, we could get down to 4 microwatts or a little less. But we couldn't get down that extra factor of 10. And what the, the change to allowing class 2A did, it allowed you to raise that minimum number by a factor of 10. Yeah. Yeah. So the average power entering the eye is, has to be just slightly less than um, uh, 4 microwatts. Okay. That's with the 1 milliwatt and the duty cycle. Yeah. So you can figure out what you for yourself. Is a duty cycle of 250? How, how long? Yeah, well, how long is it? Okay, so you're talking about four. Okay. So, um, and that all, once that final class 2A category came in, that really opened the doors for everybody in this And how did you get permission to put it on the inside instead of the outside so that everyone would know? That was a concession that the Bureau made. They said, we consider this to be a safe product. And here is a... Uh, another case where we dealt with a um, another researcher at um, at Stanford, and and this guy was he, his reputation was better than the guy at Duke, mm -hmm. and he ran tests on a lot of monkeys, mm -hmm. and his test showed that as long as you were operating in the red, and you stayed below four microwatts, then you wouldn't have any damage to the rhesus eye, which is very similar to the human eye. Mm -hmm. um, he did say, however, if you switch to the blue, you could have some permanent damage done to the eye. So the yeah. color, the, the wavelength of the laser was important? Yes, and part, part of that is has to do with the effect of the blue light being stronger, and plus the fact that the blue light tends to focus the smaller spot mm -hmm. inside the eye, and that sort of thing. So it, it's, there are a number of factors, but basically it's, it's mainly the shift of the blue wavelength. Uh, you have different problems occurring. It wasn't, it wasn't a problem of the normal frying type of damage. Uh, typically, when you're, if your eye gets hit with a very high power laser, it's, it's, it's like frying an egg. It's gone from mm -hmm. soft tissue to basically hard tissue, and it'll never come back. You can't yeah. unfry an egg. Uh, but these changes that the fellow at um, Stanford was saying was just slight discolorations that didn't seem to affect the performance of the eye. Mm. But they were permanent. And, but he said, as long as you're operating in the blue or in the red, that's not a problem. It's only when you move into the blue that's a problem. So the laser safety issue is basically a non-issue. Okay. Even though there are some people who say, oh my gosh, there's going to be lasers out there. But you had the Bureau of Radiological Health sanctioning it. You had our own expert at Duke sanction it. You had these monkey tests being done at Stanford. And, and IBM did a lot more than anyone else in this. Mm -hmm. All of the other people basically benefited. All, the other, all of our competitors benefited from what we did because IBM was much more concerned about safety and was willing to spend the time and the effort and, and the money. To how much time did you spend? How much time did I spend? Yeah, for how many months did it take to get this result? Oh, gosh. I. I had weeks, weeks at, at the Mayo Clinic Library. I had meetings with the fella at uh, at Duke. Uh, meetings with the fella at at Stanford, uh, and then they came to see us down in in Raleigh at a joint meeting in Raleigh. Um, there were a lot of meetings, and I wasn't working at Raleigh at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, which interesting story. I was coming back from a meeting from Raleigh with the fella from Stanford, and we both got off a plane in Chicago, he went off to San Jose, and I went off to bed somewhere in a, in a flea bag hotel because Rochester was snowed in. <laughs> but yeah, this, it was a lot, of, a lot of time, a lot of weeks, and, um, uh, but I, in the long run, I think that was, was very good, simply because we knew that whatever went out there, one, it was going to be safe for the public, and two, we weren't going to get hit with a, some customer saying, huh, I got a problem. It's all due to your scanners. Okay.